you were such a young boy when you started your adventure with music, yes? And I have a question. Uh, your uh, home were full of music. What was fascinating you in music? What did fascinate you to just start doing music? And uh, because you were seven years old? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, my dad was um, worked at a radio station. So uh, I grew up with music around the house my whole life and uh, all kinds of music, everything like from blues to rock, country, R&B, gospel music, uh, funk, James Brown, things like that. Um, so I, I listened to everything, but I really connected with blues music when I was a kid. And for me, I think it was because of the emotion that's in the music, because the the one requirement, the main requirement for playing blues music authentically is that you can play it from your heart. And so when you're a little kid and maybe you can't understand the words, you know, in the song or what he's singing about, if somebody's playing an instrument from their heart, a little kid can still connect with that. And so I, it just pulled me in and I really loved it listening to the blues and i also like i was drawn towards guitar so there's a lot of guitar and blues music too so that's what really pulled me to blues music but music in general is really great because it makes you feel things you know and it generally my music i try to write and record music that to make you feel good to make you feel better um if you're having a hard time you put on some kenny wayne shepherd and then you have a smile on your face you know you were 13 uh, when you did sign your first uh, contract, mm. album contract. 16. 16, I'm yeah. sorry, 16. Uh, so how did you feel? Were you scared? Or maybe you felt the power to work for that, for that music? I, you know, I was excited, but the thing is, is uh, in the United States and probably everywhere, um, the odds of, of being a successful musician it's almost like winning the lottery. So it's really hard. Like um, if you compare the amount of people that are successful musicians with the amount of people that want to be successful musicians, it's a big difference. So I knew that it was exciting, but I, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I knew I had a chance to make a record and to write songs and go make an album that I wanted to make, but I didn't know if the people were going to like it or not. And thankfully, they did. Yeah. Going back to the beginning, I heard that you start uh, when you when you first uh, listened to Stevie Ray. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yeah. Well, so like I said, I grew up listening to a lot of music, and like one of my favorite memories as a kid is putting the vinyl records on the uh, turntable. And, you know, jumping up and down and playing air guitar. And I used to listen to ZZ Top. My favorite album as a kid was Fandango by ZZ Top. And I'd put it on the record player and I'd jump up and down and, and play guitar. I didn't have, you know, really know how to play guitar yet. So I liked other musicians, but something about Stevie and his playing really grabbed me. And so when I, I saw him play for the first time when I was seven years old, and I got to meet him because of my dad. And so um, he set me on an amp case on the side of the stage and I just watched him and I was completely mesmerized, you know? And uh, he just affected me in a really big way. And so from that point forward, all I wanted to do was learn how to play guitar to try and affect somebody the way he affected me, you know? Well, you from New Orleans, um I heard that you play a lot. As a matter of fact, I have a record, so so you did um, play with Brian Lee. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about work with Brian Lee? Well, Brian, he was the first guy that let me get on stage with him when I was 13 years old. So I was, we would go, my dad and I would, uh, we would get in the car on the weekends and we would go to New Orleans or we would go to Austin, Texas, or Dallas, Texas, or Memphis, Tennessee. We would go all these places to see live music. But we went to New Orleans a lot. And my dad saw Brian Lee first, and then my dad turned me on to his music. So we would go down to see him in the French Quarter at the old Absinthe House bar. And we did this a lot. And then eventually, my dad and a bunch of his friends were down there, and one of his friends 
approached Brian and, and asked Brian if I could sit in with him. And so he let me, and I was only supposed to play two songs and then get down. But after I did the two songs, he wouldn't let me get off the stage because he, he, he was enjoying it. So that was my first time on stage, and I got standing ovations and everything. And I was really nervous because I was like, well, I've never been on stage, so this can go really well or it can go really bad. So we'll see. And it went really well. So Brian and I became friends. And then I had him, when I did my first album, I had Brian come and play rhythm guitar on the album. And I've had him, we did the 10 Days Out, the documentary film, and we had him in that. I've always tried to uh, tell people about him because he helped me out when I was young. And he never really broke into the mainstream, so I've always tried to, you know, get him more exposure because I think he's a really talented guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of 10 Days, uh, I noticed that the version of The Trill is Gone, which we know already, we heard about a million times, uh, that version is very interesting. Um, that it was the BB uh, King Orchestra, or, mm -hmm. or it was the old band. Or it was old, his band. It was his. That's what yeah. I thought. Yeah. But the uh, the version of this number really kicked me off because, again, you know, I know I don't know how many versions. It's okay, mm -hmm. but that version was very good. It was some specific about the place or, or recordings or. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so that was. Um, in Indianola, Mississippi, yeah. which is like where BB kind of grew up there. Yeah. yeah. So it was in a place called the Club Ebony, and it was probably as big as this room. So it's a really small, original blues juke joint, and so it's a really rare. It was a really rare thing to be able to go and see BB King and his band in a place this small, and uh, and. And it was, uh, he did this every year. He would go back there once a year to yeah. play a free concert. Well, he didn't charge any money. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think he was just happy to be there. And it was unrehearsed. I just got up on stage and played with him like I've done many, many times before. But I think there was, you know, there was something special in the well, air for sure. Special, the yeah. recording is perfect. The, the drums and everything is just very, really, very, I remember that very well. I don't remember any. Any version of this specifically, but I remember that. Right. Well, what's interesting about that, not a lot of people know, but so we were doing this for the film. We we had a, a bus with a bunch of recording equipment, and then we had another bus with a film crew. And uh, we that night, so BB's doing his show like he normally does, and they said, okay, he's going to call you up on. I can't remember what the other song was, but they said, he's going to call you up on this song and you're going to do that and you're going to do The Thrill Is Gone. And th those were the two songs. So we had two songs to record. I got on stage and we do the first song and something happened with his microphone and our recording equipment and they couldn't hear him singing. So we're, record we're trying to record this and his microphone's not working, right? So we're playing and one of my one of my guys runs up on the stage and takes his microphone away from him. And everybody's like, what's going on? And then they go and they plug in another microphone and they got it just in time for us to start. The thrill is gone. And if they wouldn't have fixed it, we wouldn't even have had that recording. Oh. So it barely made it on the record. Interesting. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, your audience loves you so much. And I think we will see it today in in mm. but my question is what do you love in your audience what do i love in my audience yes. well the fans are <laughs> i mean the fans are they're very passionate about this music i mean when you become a fan of blues or blues rock or you know whatever you want to call it generally people are fans for life you know and it's a really great kind of music to be a part of because then you can grow and evolve as an artist and uh, you can have a lifelong career playing music. I mean, BB died, he was in his you know mid late eighties and he was playing music almost up until the day he died. We just did a tour of Buddy Guy in the States and Buddy is 82, 83 years old, he's still doing it. So you can't do that with all kinds of music. I mean, you can't imagine a pop singer on stage singing pop songs at 82 years old, it'd be a little weird, right? Yeah, well, except for him. You're right. He's the one guy. But he's rock. He's not pop. Yeah. But John Mayall is 86, right? Or Who? He's a John, John Mayall. Mayall. John Mayall, but he's blues, he's right? Blues. Yeah, exactly. So, 
the bands are the, are the best part about this because they enable us to do what we do and they support us and they're always there for us. And, uh, and what's interesting is the last time we came here, which was, uh, I guess, about eight years ago, and I had never been to Poland before, and we played in this place, and it was a wide open building, and the crowd, it was packed in there, but they were so loud, and like so, it was one of the best crowds of the entire tour. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to coming back, because I remember that very vividly. I remember that they were so excited that I told my people, I'm like, we should come and film a live concert here, because these, this audience is so good. Like that's the kind of audience that you want in a live DVD, you know. So, yeah. yes, I was there. It was in the Hojo. The <laughs> place was the Battery Club. Yeah. 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 The Battery. That's right. Great, yeah. great show. Yeah. But uh, in 1991, uh, I was the first uh, Polish uh, journalist to interview you by phone, mm. uh, and you were very enthusiastic about. Uh, the music and the, your career mm -hmm. uh, from the perspective uh, do you think the dreams come true mm. yeah absolutely because i remember what it's like to be a little kid sitting at home playing guitar and looking on, at magazines and seeing people my heroes and just like imagining what could it be like to be like one of those people and then later i would see myself on the same magazine you know uh and so to me, absolutely, you know, dreams do come true. I mean, mine have certainly come true. And I had no real expectation, you know. I just knew that I got to play guitar and people were starting to show up to hear me play. And thankfully, it's like now it's almost 30 years later and and we're still here doing this. So, it's good. When, uh, when you decide to uh, cover a classic or blues uh, song like Trigger's Gun or others. Uh, do you do it because, uh, because you want to improve it or you want uh, to uncover a possible hidden potential it has uh, which uh, it wasn't exposed in the original version or is it just a tribute? Well usually for me it's a tribute. I don't ever think that I'm trying to do better than the original because I mean that would just be an inappropriate thought. You know for me I do it because I, it's a tribute. I appreciate the artist. I appreciate the song. And also, I think we can do a good version of it, you know. And we certainly will do our own version, but we always try and stay true to the original. And not like, some people like to go and completely rework a song. But I don't always like to, I don't like to do that so much because I don't like to alienate the original idea behind the song you know i just like to do it the way i like to do it you know but it's usually just a tribute you know it's because i love this musician i love this song and i think we can do a good job doing it so tell us a little bit about being invited to to make the the cover of you know blue and black with five fingers that's fun. oh yeah how, how was it yeah. that was cool did you like it did you enjoy it yeah absolutely um i've been waiting because that song is like 20 years old now and that song was a big hit uh, for us. We had a big, num we had number one in the States for many weeks with that song. And I always believed that that was a hit song and it could be a hit for anybody. I believe a country artist could, could record it and have a hit with it, a metal band, I mean, whatever. So I was waiting to see if somebody was gonna come along and cover that song and I, it, then they did it. So they did it for their album. They came out in December and then they called and said, well, we want to do another version and have you play on it. Then I said, okay. And then they got Brantley Gilbert, who's a country artist in the States. that has got a big following and he came in on it. And then they got Brian May from Queen to play on it as well. So we all came together. You have metal, classic rock, country and blues rock all on this one song. And it's number one in the States right now again. So it's cool. It's it. The song is a great song, no matter who does. Do you find anything in common with Brian May? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's certainly things in common, but we didn't record at the same time oh, okay. because I mean, he was somewhere over here and I was in California. And so, you know, that unfortunately, we did not all come together in the same room to do that. Yeah. Would you like to say uh, something about the, the rights uh, project? Yeah, well. Do you, do you think that there will be the chapter number three? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking about it very 
uh, Goldberg and I have already written about four songs. Um, Steven was busy last year. He was touring with Judy Collins. I was touring for my last record, Lay It On Down. So we were both really busy. Um, and then Steven had some things happening at the beginning of this year. And then I've obviously been preparing for the release of my new record. And so the goal is for us to come together at the end of this year, probably November, December, January, and write and record another record. Uh, then you collaborate with the, the, the new songs together or just? Uh, no, we do it together. Yeah. Yeah. We, we always, we get, uh, all three of us get together at Steven's house and we write songs until we're ready, you know, to make a record. Yeah. What do you think uh, has Jimi Hendrix uh, any kind of influence on a modern guitarist? Oh yeah. There are just 50 years after after Woodstock and him playing the American anthem. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, I mean, good expression. You put the experience. Hand. Do you want yeah. to follow it? Well, Jimi Hendrix is one of my biggest influences. Every night. At the end of my show, we do a version of Voodoo Child. That's the last song of the show ever since I was 15 years old and put my band together. So he's a huge uh, influence on me. Everything from playing to like uh, how he moves on stage and things like that. You'll see at the end of the show, you know, I do like a thing like this. And that's, you know, Jimmy used to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's constantly regarded as the greatest guitar player of all time. And that's everybody has an opinion, um, you know, who's who's the best. Uh, I don't know, but he's certainly one of the greatest for sure. And his songs and his music have affected, I think, every guitar player that has come along since he, he was alive. So, yeah, he has far reaching influence, but especially on blues and, and rock music for sure. Who was involved in that project you uh, were in, uh, Experience Hendrix? Do you that? Well, it's been different every year. I did. I, I I actually did not do it this year. They were doing it, but I okay. I didn't do it this year. But you know, there's been everybody from Buddy Guy to uh, Joe Satriani, Zach Wild, Eric Johnson, myself, Johnny Lang, Doyle Bramhall. One time, uh, Susan Tedeschi was on it. Um, Kev Mo has done it. Uh, a lot of different people Taj Mahal they it's interesting they they kind of change it up you know each year That's interesting, <coughs> but... mm -hmm. tell us about cars <laughs> <laughs> what about them <laughs> I love cars I, I mean know. it's like there's what, what's the oldest you got the oldest car yeah 1964 Dodge 330 um, a lot of uh, a lot of guitar players love cars. No, I know, but I know you love cars. You oh, love yeah. cars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, ever since I was a little kid, I love cars, and the music has my career in music gave me the opportunity to pursue my passion for cars too. But you know, Billy Gibbons and yeah. Jimmy Vaughn, Jeff Beck, you know, even Clapton, all these guys love cars too. Yeah. Thank you. 